Well, hello, and thank you for joining us on another episode of our Shine and Arapahoe Productions podcast here, coming to you from the uh, Concho uh, Mediaplex here in Concho, America. Joining me today, I have uh, folks uh, who are going to talk about our the Shine and Arapahoe Tribes MMIP uh, chapter. So if you, if you guys would start, uh, we'll start with the governor, of course, <laughs> and introduce yourselves, and we'll go over to the table here. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Reggie Wasney, governor. Good afternoon. I'm Bobby Hamilton. Good afternoon. I'm Lorinda Morgan. Okay. Well, that was short and sweet. <laughs> so I, I know that the chapters uh, where we just discussed – uh, around a little over two years old, and I'm just, uh, I know that there are other MMIP chapters in Oklahoma. I, I'm guessing we're one of the youngest. I, I, I guess, uh, Lorinda, I would ask you, just kind of, you know, uh, obviously there's a need for something like this, but kind of where, where did it grow out of and, you know, uh, kind of what went into making this happen? Okay, our Shine Arapaho MMIP chapter was created to help support the tribal members um, and families of missing and murdered indigenous people. We created this in 2022 because in our area uh, there was not a chapter represented. Uh, I was working just as a sole advocate, and there were at the time 11 10 or 11 other MMIP chapters that covered all parts of the state. And so when it came to any type of uh, Shine Rapaho MMIP cases or information, they reach out to me. And I just felt that it needed to be more than myself, you know, that we had a whole tribe here in Northwest Oklahoma. And I spoke to the governor about it, and he wholeheartedly agreed that we should start a chapter yeah, that was that's what I was just about to say. You know, uh, uh, a great idea like that. It only makes sense that we would have one. But you can't just jump in and uh, say, "Hey, we need to do this." But you need backing from the the tribal government, like yourself, Governor Westney. Yes, <laughs> that's your cue. Yes, okay. <laughs> Obviously, um, it's something you feel strongly about as well. You know, um, it it all started out as W. I mean, MMIW uh, with with the with the women and. And I think as time evolved, I think it encompassed uh, more of the of the tribal people, all of the tribal people, actually. So we had some cases uh, that we wanted solved. We wanted opened. We wanted uh, the cold cases to be opened up. There wasn't there wasn't a law or a policy at the state level or the federal level that really allowed tribal people to um, enforce laws or policies. So. Uh, Lorinda had started this uh, and got a lot of people involved, all those people who had uh, murdered and missing loved ones, uh, and they didn't necessarily have to be our tribe. Uh, we had a lot of tribes uh, respond and come up, and uh, we had a parade, and, and uh, we had speakers, and uh, everybody kind of told on how they uh, were affected by their, their missing one or their, their, uh, uh, their parents or their, their mother, Anne, or somebody who had disappeared so we were very, very interested in trying to do something, and, and we advocated uh, state law, federal laws, and, and through that, you can see that uh, Governor Stitt signed a bill uh, in regards to the MMIP, and uh, we had uh, federal and other states learned to help other states get their laws passed. So, so it, it was, it was a, a, a really good convergence of all the people who were interested and it necessarily didn't have to be somebody you lost in your family but you supported other families as well to to try to help them find their their loved ones or open up those cold cases that that were set aside and 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 you know and as Indian people we always kind of feel that the public doesn't look at our lives as being important so we get pushed to the side and somebody of greater wealth or High prestige may have their cases looked at and and continued and resolved. So we just wanted all fairness to say that just tell us who committed this crime or help us find our missing loved ones. So we we tried to we tried to make that impact and, and I think we did. We advocated and we did make that impact. We went to all levels of the government, state, federal, tribal governments. We got a lot of participation, had a rally at the Capitol. So uh, we, we did really well. And, and I think that uh, 
with all the organizational events that we had and, and it going out to the media and, of course, our local advocates and uh, putting together a committee and committee members uh, participating and and everybody uh, putting their best foot forward, it, we I think we made a great impact. And across Indian country, you know, people have noticed what we've done and, and we've tried to help uh, organizations as well get uh, organized and get bills passed at their state level. So, so I think we made a, a pretty good impact, and and we were more than happy to to help and and get this uh, this process going through throughout the not only the state but through the country. And now the bureau, the BIA, has offices for MMIP as well. So we've we've definitely made uh, uh, this awareness that we wanted to create. It, it has been acknowledged and it's been put into force. And there's now laws and policies made. So that, that that's a great thing, and, and I'm glad that's been accomplished. Yeah, you mentioned the word convergence, which I think is uh, absolutely the right word <laughs> to happen there. That's, you know, when, you, you know, you you can try to do something by yourself, but I think we all know that, you know, you have to, you have to make, uh, they have to have collaborations, you know, you have to have buy-in from other people. And, you know, you may not like to work with other trust for governments or you may not like to enjoy. Let me say enjoy. I mean, that's what I meant. You might not enjoy working with state government or federal government, but it all has to work. It's, it's so necessary. I mean, we're seeing that in Congress right now. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like you guys have to work. I mean, it has to work together, uh, you know, both parties and it, stuff has to to it has to converge. Be there. First of all, everyone has to get to the table and be convinced that, that coming to the table is a worthwhile uh, effort for something like this. Uh, you know, Bobby, we talked about awareness. You know, uh, you know, you know, Native people have been aware of this issue for years, and 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 not just years, but decades. You know, and, and it's something that's been around forever. Uh, but to the larger public, MMIW slash now MMIP was it. It still is something new. Uh, and but that the, the it's 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 amazing to see that the, the how people have picked up on it, and I'm talking about you know the local media, especially and and national media, and now now you see it in newscasts, now you hear about it on the radio, and and, and this MMIP chapter has had a hand in that. You know what 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 have you seen on your end uh, on on this issue and the, and the bring it to the forefront. Mm. My insight on this has been um, there from the beginning when uh, <clears throat> Lorinda first started the chapter. And to me, you know, I take that to heart. Uh, I wanted to get involved uh, with this awareness in many ways. Um, when you say that it, you know, it's new, um, it is and it isn't. Because if you look throughout our history of our, uh, of our um, Cheyenne Rapo people, uh, there, there have been missing and murdered indigenous people throughout history. Uh, if you look at it in the sense of um, Sand Creek, if you look at it in the sense of um, the Washita massacre, if you look at it in the sense of um, you know recently like um, the Carlisle students, those are missing and murdered indigenous people, our relatives. So in a sense, today, when you look at it, you know, it's still happening. It's still happening in a sense that um, a lot of our tribal members are still missing. We don't know where they're at. Um, same way, you know, throughout history again, you know, I just go back to our ancestors. They suffered the same thing that we're going through, but in a different sense. Uh, my family has um, been uh, affected by this. Um, I, I know other families that have, and, you know, it, it affects a person spiritually, mentally, physically, uh, in all aspects of our being, our being that, um, you know, we face this. And um, so I became involved to support all our um, tribal members, all our indigenous people, and it's not just a problem that's here in Oklahoma. It's throughout the United States and Canada and me through Mexico. You know, it, it's widespread. So bringing awareness to this um, sensitive subject, you know, I feel it was important for uh, me to get involved in this. 
And uh, just like you were talking, uh, just kind of what I'm uh, piggybacked on what the governor said about um, uh, making it, I don't, I don't know if you use, use the word fair, but I, I, I'd say equitable, you know. Uh, all, and it's not like it's, when I say we, I mean we, as, as Native people, it's not that we're asking for special, anything special, uh, individualized uh, favors. No, we're just asking to do, you know, what you do with every, every other population. You know, and just because uh, there's a so many, uh, you know, you know, uh, minority populations are, you know, I, I guess mar- the word be marginalized, I suppose, you know, just because the population may be smaller, that doesn't mean that they deserve any less than, you know, they they deserve the full investigation. You know, I mean, uh, I you know maybe, you know, certain populations don't have the political clout, but political clout. And, and and status should not uh, determine whether or not your your you know your death gets investigated properly, and I and and the thing one of the things you guys both just mentioned is uh, you know I, I think when just like when uh, when let's just say let's just say it's not even missing a murder but someone when someone passes in your family you know it affects that immediate family and the extended family and something like this that's traumatic like this. Uh, especially when there's no answer, when there's some, when there is no, that person is not found or they found and they, they don't know what happened, then that, that's extra trauma on top of the original trauma. And that's something that's, um, uh, man, you know, you know, you, you, that's, <laughs> I think when something like that happens, the last thing you want to do is pile on. So Lorenda, I know that, you know, and I don't want to, you know, get into your, business if you don't want to, but I know that, you know, that's kind of what you got you started in this whole um, on on this mission you're on, correct? Yes. Um, interestingly enough, you know, what you just touched upon is something that we are currently working on for tribal members um, is helping get their case pushed along, um, like currently as of today. You know, and I had spoke with the OSBI just before coming over here. And that's one of the things that I think back when my cousin Ida Beard went missing um, before that time and around that time. Uh, Can I, I'm sorry for our people who don't know, what when was that? Uh, Ida Beard, she went missing in 2015. Okay. So in 2015, when she went missing, you know, there were, uh, there was a lack of investigation on her case. I remember um, in 2017, um, I had, in 2016, 17, I had started talking about, you know, her case um, and publicly. And I got invited to speak at an AIM rally at the state capitol. And in 2017, um, you know, the MMIW campaigns and awareness was spreading down from Canada through the American Indian Movement chapters. And the Oklahoma chapter was having a rally for missing and murdered Indigenous women. And they had asked me to speak, and that was the first time I had spoken about Ida publicly. Um, Seems like from that point on, you know, we started having chapters pop up. Um, We started having a lot of advocates. People started learning more in the Indian communities about this issue and this epidemic. You know, but back at that time, you know, um, we didn't have— someone at the OSBI that we could call that was doing missing and murdered indigenous people cases. We didn't have the missing and murdered unit at the BIA. We didn't have a missing and murdered tribal liaison at the, you know, uh, U.S. attorney's office in the Western District of Oklahoma. So now, current date, you know, we have someone that, hey, if, if our tribal members' cases are not being moved on, if there's a lack of appropriate investigation, we have people that we can now call and say, you know, we request this case to be monitored. We request this case to be looked at by someone higher. And so, you know, it's fortunate that we have these outlets now that we didn't have previously. And I can say that, you know, with Ida's law being passed in 2021, which creates a a um, office of liaison within the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. There is dedicated staff that is, you know, 
that will investigate the cold cases, the missing and murdered cases of indigenous people. They have a big, long list of things they have to do. Um, they're still working on getting to that point where they are, you know, cre um, collecting data. Um, they will be offering trainings to law enforcement, you know, on um, missing and murdered issues, jurisdictions. But kind of going back to that, that law being passed in 2021, um, that I, so I saw last year we had a tribal member's uh, murder case um, in Oklahoma City. Um, it, it was investigated promptly. You know, within a year, they found the suspect, you know, it's, it's going to go to trial. You know, that, that, that didn't happen previously. Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people say, you know, like, well, my case never got investigated. When we started this chapter, I requested that if we had any tribal members that, you know, needed to report their case, we have 31 uh, tribal members that um, reported that they have a missing and murdered um relative. Now, in the state of Oklahoma, like the data is what is incorrect because within um, some data from the Department of Justice, they show 45 current missing and murdered cases of all tribes. And then they have... 30, that seems a little low. Yeah, 31, which are outside of state, outside the state. So a total of, and, and they have unidentified, which is a total of 81. And we have a reported 31 cases that have, you know, not all of these cases have actually been investigated, have been solved. They're cold cases. So, so that's, you know, the data right now, everybody, as you know, is trying to figure out, you know, what, what is the accurate data? Because I know when I was working with Ida's Law, uh, I had to work with the OSBI on trying to collect data and the FBI. Well, one of the issues that I saw with the FBI data, the federal data, was that um, when they report, um, like, for murders, missing persons, you know, like, homicides, they – their descriptions or their – I guess their the – I'm they sure report, you have different classifications. Classifications, but – Native Americans don't have their own classification. Oh, they're lumped I knew you were going to say that. They're, they're lumped in yeah. with Pacific Islanders and, yeah. you know, different ones. So we don't actually know yeah. on that on that level what the numbers are. I mean, if you're dealing with federal and state and county and city and, and in tribal, I mean, it's, it's no wonder that numbers are going to be all over the place. So I, I think what I'm hearing is like, um, so Ida's Law went on the books in, in 21 and that uh, that that position, uh, did the person start that job in 21? Mm -hmm. So it's been there for three years now. But what I think what people need to understand is um, it's not like you can jump in with nothing, with a blank desk, and then two, three weeks later have it all figured out. And three years is probably just enough time to get a good, get a good take on it and really figure out which way to go from there. And as, as we know, dealing with federal agencies, it's not like you can say, hey, would, can, you send, can you send that list over? And then boom, that list is on your desk. There's, there's, there's a lot of people you got to go through. There's a lot of forms to be signed and things like that, right? Yeah. But one, one good thing I can say is, um, you know, the, the agencies collaborate. Like I can, you know, if we have a tribal member that will contact the governor and say, hey, we need, you know, help on their case, he'll contact me. I can send an email to the BIA, the um, OSBI, the um, Department of Justice and say, here's what we need. Here's our issue. Here's, you know, what our tribal member needs. And we can have that conversation about what can be done, who's going to do it you know, where we can go from there and who has jurisdiction. And so, you know, we didn't have that before. We didn't have, we didn't have that assistance before, but now we do. And that's really important. Governor, I know, uh, you know, you, you're basically the head of a, you're the CEO of a basically a big company here. Uh, and, and so if in that regard, if that's, it's kind of, it's kind of what your job is, then something, an issue like this would, would be something that, that, that a CEO generally wouldn't get involved with. But it's, I mean, it's obviously it's not a cor big corporation, but this is something that, that really cuts to the core of not just Native people, but, I mean, 
anyone, any any people, they want their people to be taken care of and found and 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 um, treated properly. So so in, in in that regard, you know, as you know, you the uh, since you're you're uh, you're the person in charge, you know, the bug stops <laughs> with you. Uh, so you know, it. I mean. I'm just saying, it, I think if, if I were to call you, I think you might say, well, Darren, I'll check in that later at some point, you know, but my, you know, so, but I'm saying it for, for, for one of your, uh, a tribal member to say, come to you and say, governor, we, we really need to do this. It has to has be something that really grabs you and, you know, for, for the, for the executive um, department to step in and, 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 and help orchestrate this, you know, you've got to feel strongly about it. Yes. You know, one thing that society doesn't understand is that Indian people, we're close. We're, we're interconnected somewhere, somehow, uh, whether it's traditional or we're, we're at the same event, that, that we're close. And a lot of times we're pretty much related a lot of times. So, <laughs> so anytime somebody <clears throat> asks, you know, you always kind of feel compelled that you want to take that request forward and when we started this committee, and like even now, people will ask my uh, my niece is missing, or uh, what can I do? And I would send Lorinda a text and say, "Hey, Lorinda, they're having an issue, and, and maybe she may yeah. ask for, okay, what's the number?" And we've kind of coordinated that way at times when people uh, requested uh, help from me, and then I, I pass it on. But but you know, it, it it's it's our way, and it's a traditional way that when people come to you, you ask and ask you for help, you you normally will help them. And that's just what I don't think the mainstream society understands, that that we try to help each other as much as we can, whether you're a leader or you're just a, uh, you know, you're just a grandma or aunt or, or somebody in the family. But um, with my position, I do hold a little bit more authority, so it's a, a little easier for, for me or, or to give that to Lorinda and say, call them up, and if they say something, you know, tell them the Cheyenne Rappo tribes, and, you know, she would go forward with that. So so it, it does – it does uh, uh, if you've lived in this area and you've grown up around here, you understand that you have an obligation to help a lot of times. Yeah, so yeah. just not at, just not as a tribal leader, but uh, any position you're in, any title you hold. Like I said, you could be an aunt, a grandma, an uncle, or somebody, and, and you're compelled to help if somebody asks you for help. So it's just it's just a way of life for us. But it is it is um, compelling when somebody is missing or murdered, and uh, you want to know. Who it is, where they're at, and is there any danger out there that may be forthcoming to any anybody else that you want you want those cases to be resolved? So, so it is important. Uh, you never think twice whenever somebody says, "I need help." So, so that's the good thing about our, our culture and tradition is that, that we try to be there for people as, as much as we can. So, so uh, yeah, we we do try to uh, bring those issues forward as as much as we can. Have you spoken with uh, a, a much other? Other tribal leaders in our state, are they doing the same type of thing? <clears throat> Other tribes have variations. I think there are some uh, chapters and are some committees involved, uh, and some will will uh, join other other chapters. I think we have a, uh, some other tribes uh, people uh, with our chapter and with the organization. They'll come and support us, and I think we'll do the same with others. We'll have rallies in Oklahoma City at the Capitol. So – so other tribes, um, it depends on their local, uh, what has happened there locally, because I know some tribes have had some devastating uh, murders, and, and they, they do, they are compassionate about those those issues. So it, it depends, and some who may not be stronger will reach out to other tribes who are focused uh, more so on, on trying to find and resolve those cases. So it, it varies. It varies. But I think it's it's at the top of the list on a lot of tribes and tribal leaders. And I know uh, talking about tribal leadership, uh, you know, I'd like to ask you two ladies, I know that uh, we just, uh, I kind of jumped into this. We started talking about Ida's Law. And I, I mean, I think probably if, if you're listening to this podcast or you probably have, if you're from Oklahoma, you probably have a good idea of what Ida's Law is. But for those of you, for those of folks who are, who, who may not know what Ida's law is. It's been on the books since 2021, 20, uh, but uh, I know that it took uh, it took a few years to get it there. And I know, as a matter of fact, I think there was even, we, we had some momentum before the pandemic, I believe, and then it didn't happen. So if if you, if you uh, to, I, I don't know who wants to speak on it, kind of walk us, tell us, you know, kind of what it is and, 
and and what the kind of the progress of it is so far. Okay. Um, back in probably 2018, I was sharing um, Ida Beard's missing person flyer on Facebook, and my state representative uh, messaged me and asked me about it. Um, and he said, well, let's, let's get together and discuss, you know, I want to first step. That's... Yes. And I said, okay. So by 2019 in January, we met, we talked about it. He said, let's do something legislatively. Let's, you know, we, we had a few meetings and we talked and, and I just, you know, he was just so supportive and wanted to do something. So, um, we came up with this and drafted the legislation and he, um, did an interim study that year. Uh, in 2019, and I believe in October, November, he filed the legislation for the 2020 session, and that's when we started uh, the first. And the bill does law. what? What was what was in the wording um, to, to make it happen? Um, it, it was to be an office of liaison for the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, and the office of liaison um, was created. It was I think we created two, two positions. Um, of for agents to investigate cold cases, to provide training, to help with jurisdictional matters, to investigate, to um, create a database, you know, a data collection. Um, of course, you know, you were there. We didn't make it mm-hmm. through because of yeah, the pandemic. The pandemic happened. But Everything then, got shut down. But 2021 was the great the thing year. to know is, you know, there people still had that fire. Yes. And when you mentioned tribal leadership, I know yes. uh, you mentioned, uh, I know that, uh, uh, you know, we worked with our, our, the, our big, the big five to the east. Yes, <laughs> yes. We had a lot of support from uh, Chief Hoskin. Uh, Cherokee Nation came through. I mean, they, you know, I was at the Capitol almost every day during that session. Um, the Cherokee Nation delegate, Kim Teehee, she was she was there. She was there, you know, advocating. Um, they were using their governmental affairs staff as well. Um, we had Citizen Potawatomi Nation, um, John Van Poole, uh, Cherokee Nation, Adam McCreary. I mean, they they were right there uh, helping and supporting. And the Cherokee Nation um, has been a big advocate for MMIP as well as like this past year, um, the MMIP advocates, including myself, we were able to get Casey's alert passed in Oklahoma, and that was named after a Cherokee Nation uh, tribal citizen that was murdered, uh, Casey Russell. So, um, yeah, the the five civilized have been, you know, big supporters of uh, Ida's law, and I know, you know, as far as tribal leadership, I want to, you know, make sure and to let tribal members know that, you know, Governor Wassene, he uses every opportunity that he can get when we are on the federal level in Washington, D.C., to speak up for the MMIP, not only, you know, in Oklahoma. He has advocated. We have done policy recommendations through the Department of Interior for public safety, for MMIP, um, you know, asking for more funding. Um, we've worked with our congressional representatives uh, in Washington, our congressional representatives sent a letter to President Biden, I believe it was in 2022, uh, requesting more MMIP funding for Oklahoma, you know, and that was because of the work that we've done through our, you know, tribal government relations. And that letter was, um, was you know, sent primarily by uh, Congresswoman Steph- Stephanie Bice. Mm-hmm. And she, you know, being the only woman in our congressional delegation, and uh, I, you know, think it's amazing that she, you know, put us out there and said, "Hey, let's do this," you know, and sent the letter to the president. See, and the, and I and I knew a little a little bit about that. I didn't know all that. So, and I and I think for the people who are listening and watching, I, I mean, I think it's amazing how much progress has been made just in this short, you know, since, uh, you know, after, you know, post pandemic when. You know, you guys, we, we jumped back in with with the Oklahoma legislature. Uh, you know, like I said, we you know, Shine and Rapo Productions. We were there. We got yes. video when the it passed the House, passed the Senate. We got video of 
uh, 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 Governor Stitt signing it. Yes. And I said, wow, I, I can't believe it all happened. So I said so quickly, quickly. but I know it wasn't, yes. I know it wasn't well, a quick thing. We, I had people like the Secretary of State and different ones say, you know, you did, you guys did a great job, you know, because sometimes um, bills don't pass and even exactly. in the first or second year. Exactly. You know, it takes exactly. years yeah. for them to get some legislation passed. But currently this year, Representative uh, Amanda Swope out of Tulsa, she is doing an MMIP legislation in the House for increased funding for Ida's law for those positions. That's good to know OSBI. because it's one thing to create a position. Um, that's a lot of work for one or even two people. So, I, I you know, I don't doubt. I mean, I, well, I just, you know, let's just I, I, I'd like to you got to keep this ball rolling, you know, and I think uh, the more awareness that you can garner, then then the more people are um, ideally, the, the more they, they learn about something, the more they know about something, the more they incline them maybe to vote. Uh, Bobby, I know we mentioned that the, earlier at the top of this, what do we say? There are 10 or 11 chapters around the state. And I, I want to know that I, I, I know it uh, seems like we covered, um, was there one down in Lawton that we covered with you guys? Uh, the, the bunch of different chapters around Oklahoma? Yes, there was an event uh, held in Lawton with um, other chapters. Um, it turned out to be a success. Uh, we kind of incorporated some uh, stuff like on the um, fashion show, which was a you know, big, big success too. But it also brought people together to create that awareness of uh, MMIP. And I thought that was very important because, um, you know, a lot of the people uh, today, we, um, we face something different that we didn't face like 30 years ago. Social media is big uh, in today's society. Our children, they um, have phones. Four-year-olds have phones. Uh, that, Eight-year-olds that really, have phones. Oh, man. I can't, don't even get me started. That bothers me. Yeah. I think it's dangerous. So that comes with a lot of dangers um, for our children. And I think creating awareness of that to parents and it's grandparents. Just, it's dangerous for 10-year-olds. My gosh. Mm-hmm. Let's just I mean, yeah. be real here. It, it's, um, so, you know, a lot of prevention can be um, put out there to families uh, with children with telephones, you know, there are, uh, you can regulate those. You can regulate those phones. And I don't think a lot of that is happening. You have human trafficking out there that all ties into social media. Um, you know, people um, in, entice children to come and do this and do that. And of course, they're going to pick up on it. And so to keep our children safe, I think a lot of prevention, um, media, get in the media, use social media in the other direction, you know, provide awareness to these issues for our children. And even our women, even our men, you know, pro- provide that um, awareness to them. You know, they may not even think about anything like that until it happens and then it's too late. Yeah, and then I guess that's why mm. I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, MMIW kind of became uh, MMIP, mm-hmm. uh, referring to persons and, and not just women, and not to be, not to exclude anyone. I'm just saying that um, this this happens all across the, all across the board. I mean, people who are are vulnerable to social media, people who are vulnerable, you know, physically and or mentally, or especially and emotionally. Uh, those are the people that you know. Uh, uh, those those type of people prey on. I agree with that statement because um, you know I have a ten year old and I just worry about her just walking down the street. You know I have to really keep an eye on her. I have to know where she's at at all times. Um, her phone has a tracking system on it, and uh, I think that's important. And like I said, just increase awareness among our tribal members. Um, and just something simple like that. Because the truth is. Uh, uh, Native people in a lot of communities, uh, I'm just going to get real here, they're still who I w- what I would call a marginalized uh, society, a marginalized group of, group of people where, just like other minorities, um, a traffic stop may be more than just a traffic stop. You know, I mean, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, 
I'm mean, sure we all have personal stories, and we're not going to get into that. But I, I do think, um, um, you know, being brown has. First of all, I love being brown, <laughs> but I'm just saying. Let's just be honest. It's it's um it's 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 a it can be it can work the other way. Right. And um, yeah, I think too. You know, um, one of the missions of our chapter is to provide education, advocacy, and yeah. awareness. Well, on the education part, with our tribal communities, just like Bobby said, especially with the children having access to social media. But not only that, but, you know, they can download games on their phones. And you have seen, you know, I've seen news reports of, you know, some of those um, online gaming things that they download on their phone. There's predators on there, too. Yeah, that's scary. There's, there's, you know, pornography that, you know, the children could have access to through those online games. And so um, parents really need to be aware of what their children are downloading you know, and, and have access to because that's, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've spoken to local schools about is, you know, we need to go back to back in the 80s when I was in school and there was that stranger danger, <laughs> yeah. you know, learning about. But now it's a whole different level because yeah. not only do kids have to be aware of people around them in the community, like when they go to Walmart, you know, um, some of the towns just like El Reno is right off of I-40. Yeah. You know, Weatherford, Clinton, you know, there's so much traffic um, that, you know, parents need to be um, cognizant all the time of what, you know, where their children are, even going into the gas station, like Bobby said, you know, a Walmart, grocery store. And then also we have to be and aware of what be, they're doing online. You can't be aware of your surroundings if your head is buried in your phone. Yes. And I... I used to preach that, and I still do to my, well, my kids are older now, uh, but I, I used to preach that to them all the time. Uh, well, first of all, you know, I, I said, first of all, don't even mess with that phone while you're driving. And But I, uh, you know, I, uh, you can go to any high school these days or college campus, and no one is looking you in the eye. It's like, right. I don't understand how people don't, more people don't walk into walls. Every people are just. And uh, on the highway. Yeah. You see people on yeah. the highway and. Each new piece know, of technology has danger built in. It's amazing. Yeah. Or sitting at a stoplight for five seconds longer while it's green because they're on the yeah. phone. Yeah. You know, so there's, you know, technology can, can harm too. It's helpful, but it can harm. So, so. I, I think that, but that's, but that's, it's important that I, your chapter realizes that. And I think when you talked about you uh, uh, got together. Now, is that is that going to be a yearly thing? Uh, you're getting together with other chapters in, in Oklahoma? Because I think what I think what's also important is um, everyone has their own story. And I think, you know, it's it, the, the story itself may, may be a very sad one. But I think people need to hear that it's, you know, you don't want to go through something and think, Man, no one else is dealing with this. You know, I mean, I yeah. <laughs> let's just admit we, that we all got ish, we all have things we're dealing right, with. Right. And and, and the, it's good to hear it and it's good to uh, you know, so we can for bond lack of a better others. yeah, in lack of a better word, commiserate and bond with each other yes. over that. Mm-hmm. And you know, there are twelve chapters currently. I think there's a new one in the Oklahoma City um that was just created. Um and those all the chapters make up a coalition. And we have an upcoming coalition meeting in February to plan for um, all the the coalition is the one that plans for the uh, state capitol events uh, for um, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples Awareness Day in May. Um, So I know we have we have our event here at the tribe. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yes, um, that we will plan with the tribal programs, domestic violence programs, social services, uh, probably the 988 program, Bobby's program. There's a lot of uh, programs that, um, you know, will pitch in and help plan that event. And so the coalition, the 12 chapters in Oklahoma are the ones that plan the state capital event. And we have our coalition meeting coming up in February. So um, we do work with other chapters um, and you know the other tribes and we do like call upon them if we need assistance they're very supportive or we will support them um so yeah we have that um bond Mm -hmm. you know um and then also you know we try to do events and we're going to plan more events 
where we are, can support the families of MMIP. We had a Christmas uh, prayer service for the families, um, you know, because a lot of times family members, and I've heard from some right before Christmas, you know, Christmas time, holidays, people want to enjoy the holiday season, the music, the food, the camaraderie, you know, and yet sometimes those individuals that may be missing their son or daughter or... Those people are hurting. They're hurting. Yeah. They're grieving. And they have a, you know, they feel guilt because they don't want to dampen yeah. other I mean, people's spirits yeah, you, by you think, remembering you think By enjoying yourself, yeah. you're, 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 you're you know, denying your, your sorrow or your, yes, and, and your, so. your, your, it's the guilt, you know, it's like I, but people, yeah, exactly. But that's what it's about. I think getting together with that and, and, and talking with other people who are going through the same thing and, and learning how to deal and learning how to process it. Yes. So that's why we had our Christmas prayer service event was for those families to, for them to be able to come together. We ate, yeah, we sang, good. we were able to, mm-hmm. Family members were able to get up and talk about their family members, the ones that they missed and loved, without having it to be yeah. so depressing upon yeah. others. Because we were all there for the same reason. We were all there to remember them, our loved ones, and kind of, you know, and not have to feel bad about it. Like we're, you know. Um, like You're I not said, bringing anything down. Yeah, yeah. not bringing anybody else yeah. down by remembering, yeah. you know. And so um, it was a good event. You know, people enjoyed themselves. They felt good, and they, they were able to carry on and go and be with their families and have their Christmas holidays, and, but still remember their loved one. So. I have to add to that <clears throat> with our um, prayer service, too. There were toys that were donated and given by some of our nice. members that were there. So the children, you know, they were very happy Put a to, positive see, spin on to it. see the smiles on their face. And I have to say, and um, I haven't talked to Linda about this either, but one of the um, members of the um, uh, motorcycle club um, uh, local in Oklahoma City have um, pledged to raise toys for that. All right. So you heard it right here. You heard it right here. (laughs) Uh, The Oklahoma Indian Bikers Association. Hey, there it was. (gasps) Calling you up. People. Yes, so they, they <laughs> are very interested in providing toys next year. I, I wanted to jump in and ask mm-hmm. you one more thing. I feel like I'm jumping around because, you know, I thought, oh, I want to talk about that. Oh, I want to talk about that. Oh, that's a good, you know. Um, but real quickly, so we, we discussed Ida's Law, but I, I think we, and, and the governor mentioned it earlier, there have been other states that have, have, have come up with their own version of Ida's Law, right? Mm-hmm. Based on what we've done here in Oklahoma. Yes. First of all, that's a big deal. Kudos to everybody involved. Uh, who, 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 where was this? Uh, South Dakota. Um, See, that blew me away, too. Yeah. I'm like, that's not – if if out of all 50 states, I would go, <laughs> probably South Dakota is not where it's going right. to happen. And Christy Noam signed. Exactly. Signed I would have law. thought probably not her. Yes. But I think that, you know, um, MMIP is a human rights issue. Exactly. And it's not something that, you know, is a right or left issue. Compassion Um, is compassion. Yes, it's a human issue. So um, I know that um, I am on my second gear being on the Colorado um, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives Advisory Board. Um, And they have a newly created um, uh, Office of Liaison, the state of Colorado. It's under their public safety department. Um, So they are, they just, I think this is the second year. And um, so they're working on a lot of issues to address it in the state of Colorado and why it's relevant for us to be, and I say us as me as in Shine Rapho tribes, tribes, to be involved is because, you know, Colorado is our ancestral la- yeah. lands and, you know, we have a presence there in Colorado. So it's important that we be involved in this issue there as well. And Yeah, and the short are. time I've been here. The tribes, I've been amazed at, um, you know, how Colorado uh, seems to just take a take take the tribes in, and then like you know what 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 you know how can we fix this? How can we make this better? You know for you know, and so I you know it's kudos to everyone who's made that happen. Well, um, you know we we could talk about MMIP here for a, a long time, but I know that. Uh, Governor's getting itchy over here. He's like keeps checking his phone. He's a busy man. So 
Uh, I do want to give, I do want to defer to the governor, give him the last word uh, about MIP, MMIP and, and kind of where we go from here. You know, it's, it's, it's great the things that we've accomplished, just like Lorinda said, in, in up north, uh, and she's in Colorado, and, and we've done a lot in probably a short amount of time. And we, we've had uh, the bills passed, Ida's Law in Oklahoma City, and, and uh, we, we had some friends up at the Capitol who, who really helped and, and pushed behind the scenes as well. But, you know, to all those people, Lorinda and the chapter and everybody, we, we always sure do appreciate it because even today they have TV shows with a lot of MMIP uh, overtones I mean, even yeah. 1923, with the with the Indian boarding school, when when the girls are getting killed, there's there's that overtone to say this is what history has done to the tribe. So so not only locally, nationally, but even the 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 industry of, yeah, the of film, film industry, yeah. has picked up a lot of this, and uh, some of some of it's based on uh, MMIW MMIP issue. So <clears throat> with all that said, it's it's great that um, the tribes. Uh, was a great part of moving the initiative forward, and and it took people uh, uh, like our committee and in our chapter, and you know we started out small, we grew, and I think people understood that hey, we all need to to get a get on board. But you know, with with Bobby's help and and Lorinda, uh, it takes people. It sometimes you can't move a mountain on your own. You've got to have people to push, and I think we did it, and we did it well. So. You know, we just want to uh, say thank you and applaud all those people, uh, not only around the table, but out there in Indian absolutely, country who, absolutely. Who, made, who made a big difference. Because today we're sitting on a podcast talking about it where two or three years ago we, we may not have been doing this. So we, we've definitely made a change. And uh, I, I think that's just uh, a great thing to have, have had accomplished. So, so I just appreciate everything that's going on. Couldn't have said any better, right? right. <laughs> well, uh, you know what? It's time for this mu- closing music right here. And so uh, thank you all for joining us here to talk on this really important subject, MMIP. And uh, thank you for joining us here on the Shine and Rapid Productions podcast. And we will see you guys next time.